Take your Bible, if you would, please, to Proverbs 11. Let's start there. Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate it. Uh, by the way, I want to mention this again. Uh, today is Brother Sterling and Sister Gloria's 63rd wedding anniversary. Give them a hand. Um, they are the elders of our church, and I don't say that in a disparaging way. God blesses elders. God uses them. Uh, the, the wisdom that comes with gray hair is much needed in our church. And I, I found out several years ago that when all these churches, these established churches, when they were going to be changing literally everything about their church, they knew that most of the older people would not go along with it. And in some cases, those older people were asked to leave. My good friend in the ministry, Brother Noah Hutchings, who ran Southwest Radio Church for years until the day he passed away, he was pushed out of his own Southern Baptist Church in the Oklahoma City area by a pastor when Hutch came out in strong defense against Rick Warren and the Purpose Driven Life, Purpose Driven Church movement, when Hutch came out strongly against that, him and that new pastor, they kind of had words with each other, and that pastor said, maybe you need to find, you and your people need to find another church. And they basically just pushed the old people out of the church. That's wrong. The Bible says, seek ye out the old paths. The people who know where the old paths are, the people who were there, who walked those old paths. I don't know if you know it or not, but this road out here in front of our church was Highway 61. And it met up here, Highway 67. That's what it used to be back years gone by. See, I like that kind of stuff. Those are the old paths that people used to walk. And it's the older folk in our church that know where those old paths are. So I love you. And I appreciate you. Because you've had my respect all of my life growing up here in this church. Proverbs chapter 11. Uh, I'm probably just going to do more teaching than anything. Uh, I don't know why this is on my heart. Um, what was the number? Okay, I want you to look at that. Proverbs 11, verse 30. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. Now the righteous is of course Christ, but also by way of His righteousness covering us, we are the righteous. We still know what's right and wrong, don't we? So, that is applied to Christ, number one, but to ourselves also. And we know this because the purpose of, in Mark chapter 4, Matthew chapter 13, the purpose of sowing seed is to bring forth the fruit of that one seed. One seed in the ground yields in some cases, hundreds of seeds in return. That's just the power of one seed. In Galatians, we're given the nine fruits of the Spirit. We're told to be fruitful and multiply. So, I believe that it is and should be part of every Bible believer's life to desire to be fruitful for God's kingdom, to be a blessing to somebody else, to answer a question that somebody has who doesn't know what you know about God and the Bible, to be able to answer that question and to give them light into things that are going on in their life. That's why God had you meet that person. That's why God had you cross paths with so-and-so 
Because they were going in a time in their life and they had questions and they felt led to ask you because they saw something in your life that you knew something about it and you were able to respond with Scripture being a blessing to them. Believe it or not, that's all God asks us to do. That's it. It's not that hard when you think about it. So the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. You bringing life to somebody else who now is dead in trespasses and sins. And then it says, he that winneth souls is wise. He that winneth souls is wise. We have a phrase called soul winning. Used to be part of a, a program that most churches had back in the day to go out soul winning, to knock doors, to meet people on the street, talk to people going in and out of Walmart or how, whatever, however God brought it about. But being a witness to that person, testifying of the grace of God, telling them that their sins can be forgiven. It's not much of a program in most churches anymore. Maybe it's because of the times. Maybe because people are different and they don't respond to that. They don't, they don't like that confrontation. Well, I understand that because Jesus did not confront Nicodemus in front of everybody to embarrass him. He went to him at night alone, personally, and met with him. So he that went his souls is wise. It is right and good. That you want and desire somebody else that you know to be a Christian like you. Behold, the righteous shall be recompensed in the earth. God bless you for that. Much more the wicked and the sinner. Now right here in verse 31 is really the focus of what soul winning is all about. It's because we know that God blesses the righteous. And again, the righteous are... We're not perfect people, never will be in this world, but Christ has clothed us with His righteousness. Our sins have been forgiven. We have been given this gift of being pure, purified by God. And we have that free gift to offer somebody else. By the way, Ron, I still got your note up here. Ron wrote me a note Wednesday said, Pastor Mike, thank you for what you do. Look forward to seeing you every Wednesday. Sincerely, Ron. I, I got, still got it up here, buddy. I'm not going to lose that. It means a lot to me. Okay? So now, that number. Let me kind of highlight it a little bit. What number is that? Now, what I could do is go online... Look at sermon audio. Look at how many people are watching now in sermon audio. Go to Facebook. Look at how many people are watching now on Facebook. Generally, I don't talk about this much like I used to when we first started. But generally, by the time service is over with on Sunday, we have reached into somewhere around 1,500 homes. Every Sunday. Uh, a couple years ago, sermon audio had to build a separate server just for our church and a couple others because we were blowing their old servers out because of the amount of people that were watching. That's, that's not a brag. I'm telling you, God is using this church to reach people. But I, I'm always looking at not what we're doing. What else can we do? So, there's 60 people in this room right now. 60 people. Y'all look like 100 to me. Not 100 years old, but you look like 100. So what if every single person in this room went out and brought in one other person? What would that be? You know what's interesting? I did not set this up. What's interesting is the church 
started in Acts chapter 1 and in Acts chapter 2 with this exact number of people, 120. That exact number. That's how many people were gathered in that upper room praying and waiting for the Holy Ghost to move. And then they went out preaching the gospel. Now there's something that I'm going to reinforce and stress is that I'm not asking you and I'm not demanding that you go out in your own strength, in your own wisdom, trying to convert somebody. What I'm going to emphasize to you is God will give you the power to do exactly that. And if He doesn't give you the power, then you wait. It's not a sin to wait on God. In fact, God insists that we wait on Him. They that wait on the Lord shall what? Renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. Jesus told the disciples in Acts chapter 1 to wait for the promise of the Holy Ghost. He told them to just stay there and don't do anything until I show up. Then, when God shows up, you won't be able to hold it in. You'll tell somebody. So how hard would it be for everybody in this room to find one person? Make it a goal. Make it a goal. Now, see, I'm a, I'm a setter of low standards. Okay? If I get up in the morning, I've achieved a great thing in my book. So I'm going to set a low standard. Just one. For you, in your life, in your lifetime, to make it a point to bring in one person. Just one. Now, it's not about us making our church bigger. I've prayed for that for years. Ask God for it. And God in His wisdom, for some reason, has saw fit to bless us with that as also a part of our church. And those people are as faithful as anybody here is. When we have service, they watch. They listen. If they can't listen then, they will listen later. That I know about them. So this applies to everybody online as well. If all of you, 60 people here, let's say, let's say 2,000 people right now listening to us, Sermon Audio and Facebook, uh, we could probably open it up stream to YouTube as well and any other place just to be able to reach out But did you, for each person listening to me today to make it a goal in life to bring in one person So that would be what over 6,000 That are saved 6,000 people That will get to go to heaven when we Go to heaven. Would it be worth it? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would bless the message such as it is. Lord, I don't have a lot of fire in me today. Not a lot of emotion, not a lot of excitement. But, Father, this is the foundation of any church. It is what we are called for. Father, these are good people. I love them. I care deeply about them. I know the difficulties that they face in life. I know the challenges. And in some cases, God, I know some of their sins. And I love them anyway. And I'm thankful, Father, that they love me too. So, Lord, I don't want to come down on anybody. I don't want to be hard today. I would just like, Father, for you, for you to teach us, to give us a goal for our life, give us a, a purpose, 
for living for you. That each one of us make it our mission to find one soul. Just one. Father, teach us how to do it. Show us how. And then, Father, you bring about the situation. You bring the person to us. Help us to find them easily. And, Father, that way you get the glory and you, you get the honor. And we'll just be glad knowing that we helped you out in your kingdom. Father, you're worth it to us. So, Father, teach us and show us your word, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. You know, I thought of while we were praying, that one person that we're looking for, Jesus actually taught that parable. He said, which one of you, having a sheepfold of a hundred sheep, if one of them is lost, which one of you would not leave the ninety and nine and go out and find one lost sheep? Just one. You would leave the 90 and 9, and you would go and you would search out, because you know that lamb is in danger, because it's not in the fold. Lambs are easy prey for wolves, coyotes, cougars, mountain lions, bobcats, you name it. They're easy prey, except they be in the fold. So the shepherd knows that if he doesn't go out... And find that one sheep and bring them back. He knows they're going to be gone forever. David was our example in that. David was so zealous for his... It wasn't even his sheep. It was his father's sheep. David was so zealous for his father's sheep that when a lion came and stole a lamb from his father's flocks, David left the flock, went after the lion, grabbed the lion by the beard... Punched him in the face, smote the lion, and saved the lamb out of the lion's mouth. And that lion never messed with David ever again. You guarantee that. Would to God that we would have that kind of zeal for finding one lamb, one lost lamb, just one. Turn to Jude. <clears throat> Verse 20 is only one chapter in Jude. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to lay out terms and conditions for how this can be done. And I want to say this to you. Even though the number in this room is 60, I hope, I really do, I hope that each one of the 60 that's in here is right with God themselves and themselves not a lost sheep. Because if you are, then my ministry to you is to not encourage you to go out and find one. My ministry to you is to cause you to be one. You're the lost sheep that we're working on today. Because Jude says... He's going to give out conditions here for you to be able to find and effectively witness and bring in one. Now, think about this. How many people do you think you might have to go through to find the one? It probably, unless God just likes you more than he likes me, it probably won't be the first person you've got in your mind. Or the first person you try to talk to. That may not be the one. You may have to go through five, six, a dozen, 30 people who reject it to find the one who stays. But it'll matter to that one when they stand in front of God and are given entrance into heaven when they could have plummeted into the lake of fire for eternity. 
it'll, ma- it'll matter to that one that you saved. Jude said, but ye beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith. So your primary responsibility in this is, number one, you building up yourself on your most holy faith. Because we're called to witness. And in a court, a witness is only allowed to tell what they know. And if you don't know it, you can't tell it. If you personally are not built up in the most holy faith, how can I or this church or God expect you to go out and bring others in if you're only, if you save a hundred people and you lose your own soul? What good have you done? What good have you done? So in order to do this, your primary responsibility, build up yourself on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Now what that means is, that doesn't mean speaking in tongues. That means that you have, you have read this Bible and you know what this book says. And when you pray, you're only asking God for things that you know He's willing to fulfill in your life because you know the Scriptures. You would not sit and pray. Now, now, God, I know this is probably not in the Bible, but God, I'd like to have me some, some new women in my life. You know what? If God actually gives you that, it's because He don't like you and He's going to turn you over. But if God loves you, He would spank you and say to you, you need to read some more Bible before you start asking me for things. Because when you read your Bible and you know what I want and what I want to give you, then when you ask me, I've already given it to you. So that's what praying in the Holy Ghost is. Number in verse 21, keep yourselves in the love of God. Look at look at who the who the attention is on first. You, beloved, building up yourself in the most holy faith. You praying in the Holy Ghost. Keep yourselves in the love of God. That phrase, love of God. How can you tell others about how God loves them if you're not convinced that God loves you? And I'm here to tell you, and I'll teach it to you next Sunday morning if you'll come. God does love you. Because I gave this illustration during Sunday school. I don't know of a family who, having given birth to a child in the hospital... Another family gives birth to a child, but that child dies. I don't know of a family who would say to that grieving family, take our child. I don't know of anybody who would do that. They, I, I'm sure they would feel sorry for the one that lost. But you couldn't ask us to give up our own child for them. And then what are we going to do? Well, that's what God did. You were lost and going to go to hell and the punishment God put upon His only begotten Son and He did it for you. God's loss was your gain. That's how much God loves you. And you, being the kind of sinner you are, if God loves you that much, then the person that you're trying to reach, you must know that God will love them as much as He loves you. Doesn't matter what they did. Doesn't matter what they're doing. Doesn't matter how messed up their life is right this second. They're the ones who need it the most. And by the way, when it comes to looking for that one, I would look in the sleaziest, dirtiest, nastiest, satanic places you can find. Because those are the people who probably will want it. If you've ever sat and listened to people who have alcohol addictions, drug addictions, emotional issues, and listen to them plead for help because they didn't want to drink no more, they didn't want to do drugs no more, but they were powerless against it. Your heart just moves for them. And you just pray, God, would you save them? God, deliver them. You're the one who has the answer to their problem. And I guarantee you, there's still some people out there 
who are in bad shape who will want it if you'll offer it. Am I right? So you keep yourselves in the love of God. You looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Again, these are your pre-qualifications here. Because you cannot witness and you cannot testify and you cannot give what you do not have. Psalm 23 says, my cup runneth over. Well, if you don't have anything in your cup, you have nothing to give anybody else. But you've got an overflow of it. God's given you so much that it spills out of your cup. Why not give that spillage out to someone who could use it? I mean, think about what we do. We throw away so much food every day. We throw it away. And then we're struggling to feed people in a place where they don't have food to throw away. They will eat garbage. I've seen them. I watched children in Megory, Kenya pick through the garbage looking for something to eat. That broke my heart. So there's people out there that need it. You have to find them. Now verse 22. And of some have compassion. Now don't open your mouth to anybody if you don't love them. Ah, you filthy low down scumbag sinners. You're going to hell and it's probably good enough for you. Well, I've got the gospel. I don't know if I want to give it to you or not. Please don't do that. Or please don't say you're from Bethel Church if you do it. Tell them you're from the Bethel Church in Redding, California. You got to have compassion on them. You got to go where they are and see the mess that they made for their life and understand that any of us, we made a mess in our life, did we not? Isn't that why we came to Christ? Because we made a mess and we couldn't clean it up and God did it for us. So having compassion, making a difference and others saved with fear, pulling them out of the fire. Look at your Bible. What are we saving them from? It's don't ever forget this. Not too long after Lisa and I got married. I don't know where this came from, but I was just laying in bed one day and in my mind, I saw my brother-in-law in hell. When he and I first started working together, we were as opposite as night from day and we did not get along. But I kind of matured a little bit. He kind of got used to me. And there, at the last, when we were working together, we were pretty close. But that bothered me that I could see my brother-in-law in flames. And it bothered me. I loved him. So I told Ron Dagonia about it. He was our boss. And he suggested that maybe I say it to Steve. And I went, gulp. Because in my life, I've never really hit somebody. Never really did. But Steve had. And I knew it. And one day he came at me. And he was going to hit me. And he told me the next day after he calmed down, he said, I was going to punch your face in, but I saw your glasses. It didn't want to break them. And he said, that's what saved your life. (laughs) So now I'm supposed to, Gary, I'm supposed to go to him and tell him he's going to hell. Well, one day we were driving the big insulation truck back. And for some reason, it started coming out of me. And he told me a few days after that, he said, if I wouldn't drive in that truck, I would have tore your head off. And I went. (laughs) One day, we went to his house, gave him a, a tape of preaching to listen to. And he saw it, what it was, and he said, you might as well take that out of here. I said, Steve, God told me to bring it over here, so I have to do it. If you throw it in the trash, that's on you, but I have to leave this here, and I'm going to leave that here. I don't know if you ever listened to it or not. But I know my brother-in-law is in heaven. 
because God laid it on my heart, and that's the thing. You've got to have compassion on sinners. You cannot expect lost people to be acting like we're supposed to act. They're dead. They're dead in trespass. You're, at, you're trying to ask Lazarus to not stink. And you can't do that. He knew that at times I had judged him. And I played the part of I'm holier than thou to him. And he despised me for it. And I could have lost him forever. But when God finally hit him, he hit him hard. And he broke him. And he's in heaven. Because God brought him to me one day and he said, Mike, I just want to know that I'm going to heaven when I die. And I prayed with him right there. And that Friday, he went to heaven. See, God will do all the hard stuff for you. Because that's what God does. But you've got to have compassion. Save with fear. Pulling them out of the fire. Hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. No. We're not going to tell them that they're okay the way God made them. We're not going to tell them that. That's not saving them. You can't leave them the way you found them. They, God has to make them different. Give the Lord the hand. Proverbs 14. A true witness delivereth souls. So here's what I'm going to tell you. I'm going to try to correct a major mistake that has been made by church people for a hundred years or better. Lying through their teeth to try to get people to come to God. You cannot lie to them and think God's going to bless that lie. And people have actually gone out with false intentions and misleading statements, things that are not true, to try to bring them to God. Making them offers. Oh, if you just get saved, God will heal your cancer. What? God will start paying all your bills. You'll be rich if you just get saved. That kind of stuff goes out every Sunday, every week on TBN. That kind of garbage goes out. And it's a lie. But a true witness will deliver souls if you will just be honest. Be honest. Brian, be honest. You know what you were. You know what slop God pulled you out of. Don't hide from that. That's who you were. Everybody knows it. And so you can't go and say to everybody, well, I'm better, I'm better than everybody else now, and if you could just be like me, then... No, you're not going to do that. You're going to tell them. Let me tell you where I was. I was where you are right now. Let me tell you about how, what God did for me. Let me tell you about the sins and the stink that I was in that God saved me out of. Because you know somebody that's still in it. And they might just be the one. Now, I'm not picking on you, Brian. I love you. I'm just looking for somebody to nail. I'm just looking at everybody. Ed, don't hide what you used to be. Be honest. The true witness will deliver the souls. And I know you. You got a heart for your people. And I love that about you. Find one. Find one. He that speaketh truth showeth forth righteousness. Well, there's a lot here. I'm not, I want to get to this, but I think I want to do it next Sunday. Let me uh, turn to Ezekiel 33 and we'll, we'll close with this, all right? So I'm just, just kind of teaching. This is going to be the, the log of baloney and I'm going to cut it off right here and give you the rest of the baloney next week, all right? Or some more of the baloney next week. Ezekiel 33. Look at the heart of God. God is in this thing. God is in this thing. I'm not telling you anything that's not biblical. I'm not telling you anything that churches shouldn't have been doing. 
this is the church. This is what we are. It's what we're supposed to be doing. The evangelistic role of the local church needs to be put forth, emphasized, taught, and acted on. Or else, what are we doing here? Even an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting looks for other people to bring in. Do they not? Do you know a drunk? Do you know a dopehead? Yeah. Won't you invite them to the meeting next week? Oh, I don't think they'll come. Did you invite them? No. Then how can they come? Am I right on that? So who is it that you don't think will come? That's the person you need to ask. By the way, bring them here. This is the sinner's meeting. We have one every Sunday. We don't hide who we are. We don't brag about things that we're not. We are broken, tore up, wasted, full of filth and guile and everything else. And God saved us out of a sloppy life that we built for ourselves. Every one of us. So invite them to that. Invite them. Bring them. You know, typically in springtime, churches will have, they will make evangelistic efforts, and they'll have different programs to try to get people to bring people in. Now, I'm not big on programs. I'm not against them. I'm just not program-minded, oriented. Let's do this program, and let's bring such and such in. I'm asking you to ask God to show you one person to talk to. That's not hard, is it? It's not a hard thing. 60 people asking 60 people. And then we'll let, because there's a verse in here that I'll show you next week. It's not up to us to bring them in. It's up to God. But it is up to us to talk to them. How else will they know it? And they may not trust most churches because most churches have done their communities wrong. Yes, there are hypocrites in a lot of churches. I get that. So they probably won't trust just anybody's church. But if they know you, they just might come because of you. They just might do that. So you're going to see the heart of God. Ezekiel 33, 11. Say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord... I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Picture God on his throne judging everybody who is presented before. The angels go and bring every soul to God. They stand before God. God says, open the book. The book of their deeds are there in heaven. Just like a prosecutor would have a file on you. Read the charges that are against you. And God has to say, Depart from me, ye worker of iniquity, for I knew you not. With a tear in his eye. Because they are his creation. And he loved them. And now he has to sentence them to death forever. With no parole. It's like a judge taking in a, a young man, 12, 13 years old, who by that age has already killed somebody else. And a judge has to say to them, I have to follow the law and I have to sentence you. I try you as an adult and I have to sentence you to life in prison. And I have to be the one who basically throws away your entire life life because you're going to be in prison the rest of your life you're never getting out no judge wants to do that god doesn't either so now in verse 2 of ezekiel 33 son of man speak to the children of thy people this is my job and say unto them when i bring a sword upon the land if the people of the land take a man of their coast and set him for their watchman 
If when he see the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people, then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. That's why I love Jason Cooley for going out to places and preaching the gospel to those people and sounding the alarm. They're not going to listen, but they're not going to have an excuse now. Verse 5, he heard the sound of the trumpet, took not warning, his blood shall be upon him. But he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. Maybe, just maybe, you'll find that one. And they'll love you forever. They will love you forever for saving them. We say, yo, no, Jesus saves them. Yeah, but you saved them. He that winneth souls is wise, is what the Bible says. You won their soul. Verse 6. But if the watchmen see the sword come, and blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity. But his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. And I already have bloody hands. I already do. I've blown it. When I could have said something and should have said something, I didn't say something. I blew it. I can go up to men wearing military caps and shake their hand and tell them thank you for serving their country and think nothing of it. But for some reason, I don't mention Jesus. And I want to do better. Those men deserve the honor. They know what giving the sacrifice for somebody else is all about. They would get it. They would get it. And they're the ones who need it. The sword's coming. And it's coming to everybody you know. And if you don't at least try to warn them. Give them scriptures, all it takes. Do it in love. Let God have it from there. But we have to warn them. You're the watchman. You're the watchman. And you know the sword's coming. Do something about it. Let's bow our heads. I want to give you a, a minute to think, run through a list of names, and ask God to show you which one to work on. Remember, we, we're not going to save everybody. We already know that. Out of the four groups where the seed was sown, three of them die and go to hell. Only one is saved. So we're not trying to save everybody. But we're trying to find one. So all you do is ask God. That number one, your life is where it needs to be. So you can actually do what it is that you're called to do. And if your life is not where it needs to be, then ask God to bring it there. And God will. But then ask God to give you that one. Now God may give you two and five and ten and twenty. That's up to God. But ask God for one. And I'm going to give you a minute to go through a list and ask God to pick one for you.
Father, I come before you today, and I thank you, God, for laying this on my heart. God, I will admit before everybody that this is one of my weak areas. I can talk to a camera all day long. I can talk in front of people and say everything that needs to be said. But I'm very weak in talking to that one person. And Father, I want to be different. I want to find one. Father, I thank you that people have written in and said nice things that they came to the Lord because they saw us online. Father, I do thank you for that. I really, God, it really blesses me. But the one here in this area that I can speak to face to face, I want that one. And then I want another one. And I don't want to quit. God, you've called each and every one of us. It's no joke. It's no lie. There's no way out of it. God, we are called to be witnesses in all the world. So God, please help us. Put it in our hearts. Because God, I can preach this all day long, but only you can move each one of us. So God, I pray, Lord, that you would move each one as time permits, at the right time, in the right place, to the right one. We could make a difference saving them from the fire, changing their life forever. God, help us to find that one. We give you the praise and the glory for it. And we'll cast our crowns at your feet gladly because you're the one that'll do it. We love you and we ask you, God, to, to do this in our life. Not for our church, not so we can make it bigger but for your kingdom and for that one person who needs it done. Bless us, make us pure in heart, and help us to do what you command us to do, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Would you stand to your feet?